Well, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 10 of the Dry Dock. So, we're now into the double digits, yay! And we're going to kick off this week's episode with a whole bunch of various admin type things. So, bear with us. First up is a question for you lot. Uh, yeah, so you're answering the questions this time instead of me. Um, in addition to the sort of various uh, off and on series that we'll have in the special videos of alternate history versus... Uh, battle reviews and uh, generally longer looks at individual ships and such. Um, would you as an audience be interested in uh, sort of maybe 20, 30 minute, maybe slightly longer looks at historical films, uh, films like say Hunt the Bismarck or something like that, um, with a review mainly focusing on what they got right, what they got wrong um, from a naval warfare perspective. So if you're interested in that, uh, then uh, let me know. If you're not interested in that, also let me know, so I can uh, poll and see roughly what the audience interest rate would be to determine whether or not it's actually worth going and getting copies of those films. Second is that we are uh, launching a Discord server, so a uh, link appearing on the screen now. Go and have a look, um, join in. I'll be around off and on as best I can uh, during the week when life and work allows me to. And you can yeah, sort of generally have a chat with other like-minded individuals, hopefully. Um, rules are there. The full ship list for review is there, if you can uh, stomach reading through page after page of ship names. Um, and all other kind of good things. So yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy that, and uh, maybe see you around there. Third on the list, and I do have to giggle a little bit at this one. Yeah, the... Um the the special last week the uh the verses one i kind of uh logged back into youtube the next day and it was a uh, sort of well what have i done yeah that that <laughs> um so yeah well i i guess that formed a fairly popular little uh little video so I obviously will, as with all the other special series, continue with that format, but uh, don't worry, it will not take over the uh, the special slot on Wednesday. Uh, it will be a periodical. I am listing up all the various verses, and we'll cover them as we go. So, yeah, hopefully spin that out for a bit. So, the final thing before we get on to your questions is that some of you may have noticed that we passed the 5,000 subscriber mark uh, a little while back. Uh, we're well on our way towards 6k, but hey, 5k is a nice solid uh, mar uh, marker to celebrate. So the little competition for this time is, here's a picture. Uh, it's a picture that I am 99.999% certain you're not going to find anywhere else, mainly because this picture was dug out of a wooden box by a relative of mine, and it was originally on an old glass plate exposure, and it's been sitting in that box for the better part of a... Well, I won't say exactly how long, because that would probably give it away. Um, anyway, the challenge for the 5K subscriber video contest is look at this picture and determine what ship, or at least what class of ship, realistically speaking, is shown in this picture. Don't tell everyone in the comments, that just spoils the fun. Um, so send it to the email address that will be appearing on the screen at some point round about now, and what you need to send in is what class of ship you think it is, uh, bonus points if you can identify the exact ship class and location, but I'm not expecting too many people to be able to do so. Um, but the key thing is, when you say, oh, well, I think it's this class of ship or that class of ship, make sure you explain your reasoning. I know that sounds a little bit like schoolwork, but I would like to hear how various people arrive at their deduction for... Um, determining the class of ship that this actually is, because uh, it took me a little while to figure out, believe it or not. But um, yeah, there you go. That's the challenge. Uh, prizes will be decided later on, um, whilst I await the arrival of information from uh, the winners of the, believe it or not, 500 subscriber competition um, to continue their little video awards and such. So the first question 
for this week is from Daniel Holland, and he says, We know your most visually satisfying ships. Uh, that was a few dry docks ago. Now, which ships, up to and including ships built or developed in 1945, in your opinion, are the most hideous? Right, well... My feelings on the French pre-dreadnoughts have been made known quite often in various videos. So, realistically, probably one of those is going to win. Um, but I'll exclude them for the minute, just so that it's not such an obvious and easy answer. And I say, well, my backup, if I was not allowed to choose one of those ships, would have to be, I think, the Italian Monitor Far di Bruno. Um, just look at this thing. I mean... The hell is it? It's a it's a raft with a battleship's turret stuck on it and a mast they've nicked from somewhere and some really weird shaping and then they've stuck an engine in it and called it a warship. I mean I know monitors are not the most pleasant of warships to look upon, but really? This is the best you could do? Um yeah, I mean, it's only redeeming factor is it's relatively small, uh, which the French dreadnoughts weren't. You could kind of ignore it on a day when the mist was lying fairly low. Flu Palupagis um, says, I know you said no recent or controversial, but what if the Argentinians had sailed out to meet the British fleet at the Falklands? Well, there's probably pushing right on the edge of my uh, little rule about not doing anything that's too recent. Um, but since pretty much any ship that took part in that particular conflict is probably out of action, barring a few, I'll risk answering it. So, what if the Argentinian fleet had sailed out to meet the British fleet at the Falklands? Now, that's a bit of the interesting one, isn't it? Um, it depends when exactly this is going to happen. You see, the Argentinian Navy at the time is technically hopelessly out of date. The vast majority of its ships are old, as in World War II or earlier old, um, obviously refitted to certain degrees. Uh, they have very, very few modern ships. They have a couple of Type 42 destroyers, ironically enough, bought from Britain, um, and a bunch of French-built corvettes that were both that were modern at the time. Um, but apart from that, I say pretty much everything else is World War II vintage. However, that actually means that they have a significant advantage in surface gun power if they can get close enough. And of course the elephant in the room in that particular scenario is the former USS Phoenix, the General Belgrano uh, Brooklyn class light cruiser, which has an awful lot of six inch guns and armor to withstand, well not surface to surface missiles, but certainly uh, 4.5 inch shells that most of the British uh, ships are carrying. However, if we're talking realistically, given how the British had intelligence teams and operatives all over the place, uh, tracking a lot of the sailings of the Argentinian fleet, if the Argentinian fleet had massed as one, the British would have known about it very quickly, um, and they would have deployed ships and submarines to counter it. They did have Invincible and Hermes, and I think the Sea Harriers would have been able to match Ventus Cinco de Mayo's A4 Skyhawks, so the air battle probably would have been a bit of a wash. And I think in the face of a threat like that, the British submarines like the Conqueror and the Swiftshires that were around almost certainly would have ensured that the biggest targets and or a certain number of the smaller targets were taken out long before they reached any kind of surface action range. You would have then had barrages of missiles, of harpoons and sea skewers from ships and aircraft, and then it, the survivors of that could have entered into a gunfight. Realistically, unless the Argentinian Navy is crazy and just determined to sell their lives at, no, at absolutely all costs, I can't see the Argentinian fleet lasting in a cohesive formation in the face of that sort of combined submarine and air attack long enough to get into the kind of surface range or short range needed to leverage their gun advantage. Louis Searle asks, um, how do you think the Battle of Jutland would have played out if Jellicoe and Beatty swapped roles? To be honest, I think this is probably going to come down to when they swap roles. Um, I mean, if they're sort of just magically switched just before the battle, 
it's probably going to go worse for the British because Jellico doesn't have the time to rectify the problems in the battle cruiser fleet and uh, if BT has been transported with his command staff he's going to completely stuff up his uh, deployments for the grand fleet but if they are swapped in say a few months before um, it and we just ignore the whole social uh, political upheavals that would have been needed to do that but let's just assume they go along with it um, so they've got time to influence their respective commands, then I think the battle goes a lot better for the British. Jellicoe almost certainly wouldn't have tolerated the lax uh, fire discipline procedures with uh, leaving the blast uh, gates and blast doors open and stocking ammo in the turrets that was present on the battle cruiser fleet, and he would have insisted, I think, on the long-range accurate gunnery practice that he forced the Grand Fleet to go through which means that when the German and British battlecruisers encounter each other, you're going to have the British battlecruisers firing a lot more accurately at a lot longer range. They're almost certainly going to have their gunnery, dis gunnery discipline up to scratch, so they're actually going to target their opposite numbers instead of le leaving ships unengaged. And that combined with their superior gun throw weight, uh, because of their heavier armament, means that the German battle cruiser fleet is probably going to come, or the first scouting group I should say, is probably going to come off a lot worse than they did historically, uh, with the battle cruisers also having remedied their flash protection and ammo handling procedures, they're a lot less likely to just randomly explode. So that part of the battle I think goes a lot better for the British. As for the main confrontation, Beatty's a lot more headstrong and presumptuous, his signals officer is atrocious, so there's every chance he might stuff up the Grand Fleet's deployment. On the other hand, Jellico is probably far more likely to actually give him useful information to work on. Um, so, barring Seymour going full retard and completely wrecking the Grand Fleet's deployment, um, Jellico is probably going to feed BT enough useful info to get the Grand Fleet into roughly the same kind of position that he that Jellico managed historically uh, and drive off the Germans. That particular set of com circumstances and confrontation may also end, therefore end up worse for the Germans because they're not going to get the chance to damage war spite. They're first scouting group being quite badly battered in the first place means they may not be available for the death ride of the battle cruisers so the German fleet might take a lot harder pasting so in that circumstance I think the, the Battle of Jutland goes a lot better for the British although there is the wild card factor that BT I don't know might send the Grand Fleet wandering away up to Norway or something equally stupid Nordman asks, uh, the US Navy used their 5-inch 38 quite successfully, helped a lot by the VT fuse, I suspect, and it seems to have been quite a useful AA gun. The British used both the 4.5-inch dual-purpose and the 5.25-inch dual-purpose on the King George V class. What I've heard is the 5.25 was relatively good but cramped in the turret and the sustained rate of fire was lower than expected but still better than the German 105 33. Um, could you find more detail and possibly compare or rate them as to their capabilities, especially in the anti-aircraft role? I think there's no doubt the 5.25 inch was the hardest hitting in the surface role and had the best range. 4.5 coming second as the shell was quite heavy and had higher muzzle velocity, but there are other factors. Um, how to work them, fire control, sustained rate of fire munitions, etc. Well, that was a long question. So specifically, we're talking about the 4.5 inch 45 uh, quick firing Mark 1 through 6 guns for the uh, British and their 5.2550 caliber dual purpose guns as well. Well, to be honest, most of the issues with the 5.25 you've kind of already identified there. The um, turret in the initial turret design was just too cramped, it made loading a lot slower, and also to be honest, 5.25, they were pushing it, they really wanted a 6 inch, but a 6 inch they were never going to get quick firing um, for the kind of rate of fire they needed, and the 5.25 inch projectile and charge, it was just that little bit too heavy to withstand, for the crew to withstand, sorry, the uh, continuous rate of fire that was needed for an anti-aircraft weapon. However, it didn't also help that the elevating and train speed of the actual turrets themselves and the gun mounts weren't really as fast as they ended up being needed necessary 
for them to be um, because effectively they were designed in an era when planes just went slower and by World War One, uh, World War Two, sorry, planes went faster. Uh, wow, I'm tired, aren't I? So effectively, um, the guns themselves were great. It's just everything around them was terrible. Um, the 4.5 inch avoided most of these problems. Um, for one thing, the guns were smaller, so within the turrets they tended to stick them in on secondary batteries. You had more room to work. The ammo was lighter, uh, which also helped. And being lighter guns, you could also move them around a lot quicker. So the only disadvantage being slightly less power, range, and um, explosive force. The Most of the problems with the 5.25 were fixed in HMS Vanguard's installation, which of course was just too late for World War II. So overall I would say the 4.5 inch was the superior weapon for the Second World War, purely because it actually just worked better and had a higher rate of fire. Um, but in once the technology had matured, you would want the 5.25 inch. Uh, it just unfortunately so happened that for the British, the 5.25 inch matured uh, just after the Second World War, so there wasn't much call for it. And by the time the next war started, um, that being Korea, it was kind of you're verging on the early surface to air missile systems, so it never really got a chance to prove itself. Deplorable Mecco Terra asks, uh, when guns were removed from a ship, for instance, removing the 20mm anti-aircraft guns, as you mentioned, where do these weapons go? The answer is all sorts of wonderful places. Um, some of them would be deployed to second-line ships and lighter ships that maybe need more AA guns but weren't right on the front lines and therefore in need of the heavy 40 mils. A lot of the older stuff, so when you're talking about things like 50 cal machine gun mounts and stuff, those would just be sort of sent into a general circulation pile for other uses in the armed forces. Um, really old stuff like the 1.1 inch guns and the pom-poms um, in the US and British navies, they're basically obsolete. They might be kept around for close range AA defense at home, um, but that's about it maybe some training units. Um, the 20 mil Orlicans were still pretty useful guns. Um, they just weren't fantastic toward the end of the war at close in anti-aircraft defense. So those would be distributed. A lot of the most common usages actually in the British Navy at least were equipping motor gun boats and motor torpedo boats where they were very effective weapons. Um, but yeah, they tended to get reused in smaller ships and shore installations. Kevin Willem asks, uh, is it realistically feasible to construct a modular battleship? I'm referring to a battleship hull built as large as possible with 11-inch guns in 1908, then upgraded with 15-inch guns in 1914, then up to 16-inch guns in 1939, then removed the rear turrets and installed missiles and a hangar in 1960. Uh, there were refits and modernizations done on ships, but the guns were never changed. I would imagine a major refit, including gun upgrades, to be more economical than building new ones. Uh, why is that? Well... To be honest, with the refits and modernizations, the main reason most of the time the guns were never changed was essentially down to one of two factors. The most common one was that because of the various naval treaties, the older guns were still relatively practical uh, until the advent of the really modern 16-inch guns in the US Navy and the 18-inch guns in the Japanese Navy. If you had a 14 or 15 inch or maybe even slightly smaller caliber gun or a 16 inch gun even in some cases that dated back from the First World War, the advantage in firepower of a new ship with a similar caliber weapon just wasn't great enough really to justify uh, replacing the guns. I mean, what are we going to replace them with? Slightly better ones at massive expense or... You could just uh, maybe supercharge the new guns or your old guns or develop new shells, that kind of thing. So that's the main reason the guns weren't swapped. The other reason was when you had things like maybe, say, USS Arkansas, they were older twin turrets and there wasn't really anything. You could, you could maybe give them single turrets, but then your broadside would be down to something pathetic and salvo fire would be impossible. So it, there basically just wasn't the space to do so. Now, as for your modular idea, it sounds great on paper, um, 
practically it runs into two problems. One is you're talking about a ship with a lifespan that's starting in the 1900s, going all the way through to the 1960s. Ships got very big very quickly. Um, a ship that's built in 1908 as a battleship is maybe going to be in the order of 16 to maybe 20,000 tons, maybe just a bit over. Um, by the end of the period, you're looking at cruisers of that kind of displacement. Um, and yeah, it's it's going to get left behind because obviously its armor is going to be designed against 1900s era ships. So maybe 10, 12 inches of armor, if you're lucky, with sort of partial plate uh, elsewhere on the ship. It's not going to have all or nothing. So when every time you're refitting it, you're going to have to be refitting it with torpedo defenses, new AA guns, better deck armor, thicker belt armor, taking off the armor elsewhere. Um, and the hull's only got a limited amount of displacement to work all this in. So that kind of time period, it's really to keep a frontline battleship up to date, it's it's too long and within the constraints of the hull and the size that you can realistically build it in the first place uh, in that 1908 period it's just going to be too expensive you'd effectively be rebuilding a new ship by maybe make the mid 20s i mean uh, even the refit even for the refitted ships that sort of came from the world war 1 period and shortly thereafter by world war 2 a lot of them were second line units um, for precisely that reason. The other issue is just how exactly you're going to do that kind of initial starting gun size in 1908, uh, unless you can see into the future and realize that these kind of guns are always going to come up. Um, the general rule of thumb seems to be, from the refits that I have seen done in various points in naval history, that if you do, for whatever reason, want to change your design to go up uh, tier in gun size you are probably looking at increasing the caliber by two inches roughly equates to losing one gun from your turret now the germans obviously planned to refit the scharnhorst and eisenhower with 15 inch guns going from their 11 inch but they kind of specifically planned for that and therefore the 11 inch turrets on those two ships were actually oversized compared to what they could have been um, and that was going up four inches in exchange for losing a single gun. The problem with going down that kind of principle is that you are not going to be able to then upgun to 16 inch uh, because you'd be down to single 16s at that point. Um, practically speaking, you're going to be looking, if you're looking at that kind of upgrade path, uh, even assuming we ignore all the other issues beforehand, you're probably going to be looking at a relatively spacious, maybe quad 11 inch turret, and where you're going to find the technology to develop a quad 11 inch turret in 1908, I don't know. Um, that might, sort of a, a large quad 11, might give you enough space to go with a spacious twin 15 or maybe a really cramped triple 15. Um, although I don't think that triple 15 really would work. Um, but that then might give you still the barbette space to go for a twin 16 later on. So you might end up, if you say, I don't know, say some stupid ship starting off with a, a full quadruple 11 inch, you might be able to work that into um, to four twin 16 inch later on. Um, but it's going to be on a hull that's vastly inferior to everything else around it and quite slow. Um, it says basically it's the t other technology around the ship, which we kind of covered earlier. Um, but yeah, the, the, the turret technology as well just isn't going to be there. And you, it's not just the guns. You're talking about having to rip out your magazines, your storage uh, systems, your transportation systems. It's, it's, just, it's not going to happen, I'm afraid. The only realistic scenario in which I can see this happening would be maybe if someone was perhaps boxing a little bit clever with um, the naval treaties in the 1930s. So we know, obviously, that sort of the Lion class was a slight evolution on the King George V using triple 16s instead of quad 14s. Um, and we know as well that North Carolina was designed to use quad 14s and then switched over to triple 16s at the last minute. So the principle is there, 
So maybe some cunning or slightly sneaky ship designer in the 1930s could potentially have designed a ship to use something like Quad 14s to stay within the treaty limits at the time. Uh, and then with a specific view, if they'd pre-designed the turrets to be able to switch over to triple 16s, uh, if the turrets were, were uh, needed in the event of a treaty breach, kind of on a similar principle to how the Japanese always planned to replace the triple sixes on the Megamis with twin eights, then that might work. And yeah, I guess at that point, probably going with two turrets at the front, one at the back, you might be able to take out the rear turret and uh, use its uh, barbette as a missile launching cell and then the rear deck as a hangar uh, or flight pad. Then, yeah, that's that's theoretically possible, but that would require some very, very cunning work uh, by a ship designer in the 1930s. Commando Dude asks, um, why did battleships really attempt to attack fleets in port or coming out of port were the coastal defenses just that strong uh, based on what happened at d-day it would seem that navies overrated coastal defenses i mean yes to a degree coastal defenses quite often got overrated and a lot of the cases when uh, coastal defenses were engaged it turned out that actually the seaborne forces were capable of suppressing or eliminating them um, but it's more that when you're talking about a fleet's in port coming out of port, you're talking about a multiplication factor of if you're attacking an enemy fleet and that enemy fleet is within range of support from its own coastal defences, that just multiplies the number of guns firing at you and you're not going to be able to put in the dedicated attention to suppress those coastal batteries that you would if you were just attacking coastal defences generally. Um, and then... So obviously they then have free reign to track in and range on you and hurt you quite badly. Obviously the enemy fleet also has the advantage of if things are going too badly for them they can run back into port, damaged ships can run back into port undercover and there's going to be a lot more ancillary craft like destroyers and torpedo boats and coastal subs available as well as minefields. Uh, minefields and subs were basically the main reason it didn't happen in the Dreadnought Age. In the era before minefields and subs, there were actually quite a number of uh, fleet attacks in or near um, various ports. I mean, all the way back to something like, say, Francis Drake going in and just burning Cadiz to the ground because he felt like it, um, despite the Spanish, what was eventually going to turn out to be the Spanish Armada mostly being in port at the time, um, all the way through to raids during the Napoleonic Wars and such. So it, it did happen, but as defensive technology, and particularly static defensive technology like torpedoes and mines, got stronger and stronger, the risk was just too great. You might as well bait the enemy fleet out into the open ocean where it's kind of an even fight and they don't have the force multipliers. Because, let's face it, if you have the stronger fleet, there's no reason to give your enemy a potential leveller. And if you've got the weaker fleet, well, there's definitely no reason to attack a stronger fleet when they have even more advantages. Commodore Ahasan says, If for some unknown reason battleship construction and use had continued after the Second World War, what types of designs would you theorise to have been created? Oh, well, this is a fun one. Um, well, the Montanas are an obvious one, not being cancelled. Um, if they had been cancelled, then possibly you might see some re slightly revised but faster version of them brought back quickly. Um, but realistically, in the post-World War II era, you're looking at sh ships that are going to need to be fast. So because they need to keep up with carrier fleets, um, and they're going to have massive AA batteries, um, because, well, again, they need them in the face of the new aircraft paradigm. However, that could go one of two ways. You could end up with the floating gun farms of the US, or there is only really one other realistic clue, apart from things like the Svetsky Soyuz project. But there's only one other realistic clue um, as to how battleships might have looked after... The Second World War, and that's a design drawn up by the Royal Navy, or a series of designs basically, which arose from some bright spark asking the Royal Navy designers to come up with a battleship design that would be able to survive the new era of threats that were faced in the immediate post-World War II environment. 
and those designers came up with a design that they concluded was possible to build. Um, it just couldn't dock anywhere in the UK and uh, would cost fantastic amounts of money and would still have nowhere near the range of strike that a carrier did, but it would survive almost anything you threw at it. The fact that the damn thing was like a thousand feet long and had ridiculously thick sort of 10 12 inch thick deck armor at one point i think was uh called for it it was basically well you'd basically be looking at a giant armored slab of metal almost a third of a kilometer long racing around at a high speed um covered in guns yeah that that's what a post second world war battleship would have looked like um some of the Art Deco stuff that was came up at the time might not actually be too far wrong, to be honest, weirdly enough. Grey Panther Gaming asks, uh, With the studies of railguns, do you believe that America are going to build a ship like a battleship with railguns for shore bombardment? And second question, how well would American modern cruisers stand against the Bismarck or Yamato? Railguns for shore bombardment... I don't think so, mainly on t for two reasons. One is the American Navy has this weird obsession with making everything GPS guided right up to their shells. Um, this has actually caused a lot of problems for the uh, Zumwalt class DDG-1000s with 8-inch guns because there's this incredibly complex guided shell that they invented for it that then turns out to cost a stupendous amount of money which kind of obviates the whole cost savings of using a gun over a missile in the first place so when you're talking about a nice big rail gun that's lobbing sort of battleship grade shells everywhere you can guarantee someone would try and make it gps laser infrared and all sorts of other fun thing guided and then have to deal with sort of super complex electronics that could survive the accelerations involved in a railgun and then you'd end up with uh, sort of shells that cost more than some small surface combatants and then the whole thing would die because it'd be far too expensive. And the other thing is just range. I mean, yeah, a railgun can fire a longer distance than a chemically propelled traditional battleship gun using gunpowder or gun cotton, but in an era where you have supersonic and maybe even hypersonic surface-to-surface -surface and air-to-surface anti-shipping missiles, the few dozen extra kilometers you might get out of firing a railgun is effectively like confronting somebody with an assault rifle and then concluding that because you are 30 yards away rather than 10 yards away, this somehow gives you some kind of advantage in not being hit. The only way I can see a mass railgun battery ship coming into service is if they either solve the power consumption issues or invent some kind of even more efficient high energy output power reactor, maybe a fusion reactor or something they can put in a ship to power them all, and then those guns would have to have vastly increased rates of fire so they'd have to solve the wear and tear problems on existing models um, so that they can effectively just throw out loads and loads of inert shells and use uh, modern electronics and radar guidance etc to just guide massive storms of fire in on their targets. As far as modern American cruisers standing up against Bismarck and Yamato, well they could just run away. Um, they're fast enough because basically you're talking about the Ticonderogas, they're the only American cruisers still in service. Um, they've certainly not got the guns or armour to stand up in a, in a gunfight. Uh, no way, no how is that ever going well for them. Um, and unfortunately they did decommission the naval attack version of the Tomahawk cruise missile, so a lot of those vertical launch missile cells not particularly useful. I mean, um, the general vertical launched SM series uh, surface to air missiles that the American Navy has can be used to a limited degree in the surface attack role. Um, but if you're sending it up against something like a Bismarck or a Yamato, you're effectively just plinking bits. They're, those are not designed as anti shipping missiles, so uh, they're going to be of marginal effectiveness against the main batteries and citadels of those ships. What would be useful, however, is that. Each American cruiser carries eight uh, Harpoon missiles, and those missiles vastly outrange any of the main batteries on the battleships in question. So 
how would they stand against them? They would probably send a helicopter or two to poke their heads over the horizon, um, find out where the battleships are, and then lob all their harpoons at them, and hope that creates enough fires and chaos to mission kill the battleship. Um, otherwise, again, probably use the helicopters poking over the horizon to pelt them with their entire ver complement of uh, vertically launched surface-to-air missiles, and hope that that breaks or sets fire to something enough to dissuade the battleship from coming in any closer. Um, or hopefully even crippling it. You never know. You might get lucky. Maybe a fire gets down to the magazines or something. And finally for this week, Captain Johnny asks, have you ever visited the Averroff, that's uh, Georgis Averroff, the Greek armed cruiser, or considering to do so? So, no to the first one, I haven't actually visited it, although I probably saw it at some point, um, as I did pass through the area in Greece about 15 years ago. Um, want to visit it? Most definitely. Um, what I really would like to do, to be honest, is compile a list of preserved warships in Europe, um, I have been to see the cruiser Aurora in Russia, but there's no way I'm going back there at the moment. Um, but yeah, no stuff in Europe like the Averroff. I uh, yeah, I kind of want to pull together, as I said, a, a nice list of things. And before modern politics overtakes it, and I have to apply for visas for every flipping country in Europe, um, I kind of want to do a whistle stop tour of uh, multiple ships and collect footage on them and uh, such like so I can bring them back and either update or do video reviews as as appropriate. Um, obviously the stuff in Britain I can always go and visit because I, I'm, I'm here and they're not getting rid of me anytime soon. Uh, so yeah, being born here makes it a bit, a bit difficult for them to do that. So yes, uh, hopefully that's a slightly rambling way of saying yes I do and kind of hope to do so before I have to apply for, as I say, for visas for everywhere. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do one more question because I did occupy the first five minutes of this video with admin stuff related to the channel and not answering your questions. Uh, Joke Franic, Franic asks, um, why are your videos titled Name of Ship? Uh, then you proceed to speak about the whole class. Why not just name the title Hipper Class? And if you do a special about the Prince Eugen, you'd call your title at KMS Prince Eugen. It's something that really bugs me about your channel. To be honest, I can't really come up with a better excuse other than I'm a little OCD about um, if I've got a series, I want it all to have similar titles. So I kind of just use the name of the lead class of the ship. Um, most of the time, anyway. Um, and also just because uh, some ships are classes of one. So it's basically just for consistency of the titles. Um, and the fact that... I Hopefully, well, not hopefully, but generally, I th I think as far as I can tell, most people who are searching for a specific ship um, will tend to search by the most well-known ship in that class, which tends to be the lead ship. Not all the time, but most of the time. Um, so yeah, it's it's just a bunch of soft factors that kind of just appeal to me. I, I can see your point. It, I can see how it would bug someone when I'm talking about the Admiral Hipper class and I call the video Admiral Hipper or whatever. But I guess that's just how I do things. Unfortunately, I can't. I can't really give you a good explanation. It's just that's just me. Sorry. So that wraps up this episode of the Dry Dock. I uh, hope there's something of in there of interest to everybody. Uh, sorry for some of the slight meanderings and mispronunciations. I'm very tired recording this episode. Um, it's being recorded slightly early because on the regular day of recording, I will be on my way to Wales to climb a mountain in minus four conditions. I have no idea why I signed up to do this. Um, anyway, if I survive... I'll be back with a special on Wednesday. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.